almost all countries were pretty unprepared and we were no exception to that rule. Despite the fact that we kind of knew something was coming from late December, there was very little progress in getting ourselves ready to go in January and February. And then when it started to really pop up at scale in March, everybody was caught unprepared. So there were lots of examples. The hospitals were, weren't really prepared for the burden of some very sick people. The testing system didn't work at all. We had no therapies, obviously, at that stage. There was not, not much you could do. We weren't really ready for lockdown. The politicians hadn't really thought their way through the non-pharmaceutical interventions. So we were, we were very unprepared. And I think that probably is the reason why we had such a high mortality in the first few months of the disease. Well, I can tell you the, the, the Oxford experience because starting the beginning of January, so the sequence of the virus was produced on, I think, about the 8th of January. That was sequenced actually by an old postdoc of mine, George Gao, who's based in China, who runs China CDC. And it was then immediately obvious that this was a SARS-like coronavirus. And we knew quite a lot about SARS-like coronaviruses. And we, I mean, we've got a very large global health program in Oxford that includes a big vaccine program at the Jenner Institute. Sarah Gilbert had a vaccine for another coronavirus called MERS that had already been in clinical studies where we'd show it, it was immunogenetic. So, genetic. so she knew she could make a vaccine in a pretty short time frame that was specific for this particular virus. So that race to do that started on the 8th of January and she was right in full tilt by the middle of January. But we were also building capabilities around how do we set up clinical trials? And Peter Horby and Martin Landry started to think about how you would do large scale clinical trials in a pandemic. So that led to the recovery trial, which was the, of course, one of the great successes in clinical trials. And we were also thinking about what are the other therapeutic interventions you might develop? Can you develop new drugs? Are there drugs that we've got that you think might work in this setting and that? So from about, I remember I went to a meeting in Oxford on about the 20th of January. There were about 40 different scientists in the room and they were all working on COVID. Despite the fact that it wasn't in the newspapers, the health service wasn't interested, politicians were busy doing something else, we we're just post Brexit, blah, blah, blah. So, so it's interesting because the research community were on point for this and, they, and it was really, I think that was one of the reasons why we did so well. You've hit on the two key interfaces that we had as, as academic researchers. One was, and this become very, became, as it became clear that we might actually have a vaccine uh, and the preclinical data was very impressive, it was pretty obvious to me that we as a university had no chance of getting that vaccine into widespread use globally if we didn't have a partner. And the reason is that universities do the research, but, and we might get as far as a late state, one late stage trial, but we don't do any of the regulatory approval work. We don't do any of the manufacturing. We don't do any of the deployment. We don't do any of that stuff. So it was pretty obvious to me and to the vice chancellor of the university, Louise Richardson, we both said, this is not going to work. We need a partner and we need one fast. So I spent about, well, I spent the next couple of months trying to find a partner. And, you know, there weren't that many partners who were available. But we were very fortunate to have run into AstraZeneca and Pascal Sorio, who is their CEO, who is very committed to getting something done in this space. So that kind of solved that problem. But of course, those interfaces with industry were widespread across the whole of the COVID crisis. So where do you get the tests from? How do you evaluate the tests? How do you get the regulatory approval for tests? And that involved working between industry and academia. Industry did their own validation of the tests, but of course they didn't have access to large numbers of people who'd had COVID at various stages and various degrees. So they didn't really know how well their tests worked. So we said, that's fine. We understand that. Give us your tests and we'll put up a standard validation program and we'll tell you how well they work, where they work, where they don't work. And if they work really well, we'll deploy them. We'll buy a ton of them and we'll deploy them. So there was a, a, an interesting relationship there as well as we went along. And also for the evaluation of drugs, which again, we did through the clinical trial networks. Government was a completely different kettle of fish because of course government had 
government was interested in the science and the pandemic, but it was also interested in everything else, the economic health of the country, how do you keep everything else going, how do you avoid society from collapsing. And they, I think it's fair to say that we have a political class in the UK who are not scientific experts. Most of them haven't done an A-level in a scientific subject. So that was going to require quite a lot of hand-holding and advice and support to make sure that they had the best support to make the best decisions that they could. And I have to say, I, I mean, I spent literally from the beginning of March, I spent the next two years advising government on almost everything you could think of. And I spoke to a government minister almost every morning. We talked about how you might do this, how you might do that. And, and on the whole, they did take advice. They were really, they wanted to do the right thing. So they wanted to get advice from people they trusted to give them good advice. They wanted to hear both sides of the argument so that they could understand the pros and the cons of going in particular directions. But my overall impression of the politicians in the UK was they behaved pretty well about making decisions that were in the best interests of the population in terms of the health, their health, and, and, and their health outcomes. So that, that was okay, but it could have been very, very bumpy. I think what we all underestimated, and I was definitely in the list of people who underestimated it, is the, you know, the, the tendency to be quite nationalistic about everything you did. In other words, make sure that our local population got our vaccines first, and then we could deploy them further afield. And of course, we got in a massive scrap with Europe about that because there was a debate about what the contract said and all that sort of thing. But the, you know, the, but also, you know, the sort of slight grating you got because some people had some vaccines that were made in their country and other people had vaccines that were made in other people's countries. And there was, I mean, the, for example, the Chinese have systematically avoided using anything, anything but Chinese vaccines. And now they're in a pickle because the vaccines don't work. So, you know, the, but, but it's quite hard for a government of a big, strong, economically viable company to say, actually, the honest truth is, their vaccine's better than our vaccine, let's get their vaccine, off we go. And that, you know, we've seen that. It's, it's happened in America. AstraZeneca vaccine has never been approved in America. I mean, you work that one out, that's completely bonkers, actually. But, you know, there was a bit of, well, we've got our own vaccine, we don't need that. And the truth is, they didn't need the AstraZeneca vaccine, so that's sort of fine, but it does tell you about, there was a lot of innuendo from Warp Speed and those sort of guys who were sort of saying, well, we're not sure about the AstraZeneca vaccine. The reality is the real world data suggests it works just as well as any of the other vaccines. But, you know, on the journey, it was difficult. And here, there was massive loyalty to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Lots of people said, I want to get my booster and they wouldn't give me the AstraZeneca vaccine. What's going on there? And so, you know, I, I, I just think it's the nature. It's the nature of people. They are likely to be nationalistic. And when times are tough, they're going to be more nationalistic, not less so. And that actually really underlines why the vaccine wasn't distributed as widely as it could have been. What's been at the heart of the success, the global success against the pandemic, has been innovation. And a lot of that innovation emanates from industry. So I think you, there's no getting around that. That's just the way it works. Now, industry gets fed by academic research and all kinds of other things, and they operate in the system. But that relationship between the engines of innovative discovery and, and, and the public sector, where healthcare is the most important, that interaction is a very delicate one, and you've got to sustain it, but also keep the balance between the two. Because the, the, although I think the top line of the missions of both entities, industry and government, is to do the best thing for people who are sick or who could get sick. So that's the top line. But then as you get further down the list, there's all the, they divert. So, you know, the industry's interested in generating profits for shareholders. Government's interested in saving money so they can spend it on other things. So there, there is, it's not a completely aligned set of missions. But, but it's aligned enough that I think you can get an awful lot done. And I think COVID showed what you could get done in that space.
But it also, I think, illustrated a couple of other really big issues. One is we, we've been building for the past 50 years a healthcare system in most developed economies, which is not very resilient and where prevention and public health is an add-on, which doesn't get resourced, doesn't get supported. And this was a classic example where the solution was, could only be prevention. And as a result, you had to think again about what were your structures to deliver that. So Public Health England, which of course doesn't exist anymore, was very fragile when we went into this. I mean, it was a weak department, not very well supported, leadership was shaky, it just wasn't a great, it was definitely not a flagship to sail into a pandemic with. And I think everybody has now said, mm, that's not going to go so well. We need to think again about how we define the prevention agenda in the, in the NHS, but, but more broadly across the whole system. It would be unfair to be critical of the healthcare system we've developed, because it was developed when we really didn't have the tools to identify who's at risk of what disease, to identify people at the earliest stages of their disease. And as a result, we, it operates very much to the right-hand side of the spectrum with people with, with well-established late-stage disease presenting to the healthcare system. So as Linda Stewart said in the discussion today, that's really, it's, it's, it's an illness system. It's a national sickness system where, in fact, what you really want to do is what we know is for every one of the big chronic diseases, and that's cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, obesity, Alzheimer's disease, the major cancers, the major inflammatory diseases, what we know for sure is if you identify people early with those diseases and you treat them early, you flatten the morbidity curve. So people live a lot longer, much healthier if you can get in early. Cancer data is clear, the cardiovascular data is clear, it's been around for 20 years, but it's also true with all these other disorders. And so I, I think my passion at the moment is to say, how do, you, how do you pivot a whole healthcare system to think much more upstream to identify people at risk, intervene at people with early stage disease, use prevention tools to keep their risk of, of progressing with their disease much lower, and then flatten the morbidity curve to save money with late stage disease. And, and, and that I think is probably the only way this is gonna be a viable exercise over time because I think healthcare with the changing demography, aging population, expansion of chronic diseases, it, it's not, this is not, you, you can't keep doing this. And interestingly, politicians and the NHS never really promoted prevention before COVID. So the NHS has never done prevention. They talk about it all the time. They never do it. It's been totally off the, off the schedule. And politicians were much more interested in, oh, we've got this new immunotherapy for people with late-stage metastatic cancer, blah, 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 blah. That, that whole dialogue has now changed. The narrative has now very much shifted to people saying, no, 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 no. If we don't get these tools to diagnose people early, if we don't identify people at risk, the whole thing's going to go off a cliff. And, and I think it will go off a cliff. So I think that's why we need to be really focused on how do we make that shift now. You know, the public, I think, are interested if you can provide them with solutions that will actually fix issues. So they all, we've been doing quite a lot of focus group work amongst populations from different bits of the country, different backgrounds different socioeconomic groups. And the one common theme that comes through is everybody does think about their health. And they think about it in ways like, well, I think I'm going to get colorectal cancer because my father had it and my uncle had it. And, or I'm really worried because my aunt had breast cancer. I don't know whether I'm going to get breast cancer. Or my, I've had two generations of people who dropped dead from strokes. So I'm definitely going to get a stroke. And so that people do, people think about their mortality in health terms, all, you know, all the time, actually. Now, I wouldn't say they perseverate on it, but it's definitely in their consciousness. So if you can offer people not just a, a story about how you could eat five lots of vegetables every day and it'll all be fine, which is all fine, I don't, I have no problem with that. But if you can offer them other tools, innovations, which will actually get them to a place where they substantially reduce their risk, first of all, identify people at high risk and then reduce their risk. 
then people are going to be pretty interested in that. In the same way that people were really interested in the COVID vaccine, people kept saying, does it work? Does it really work? And how does it work? And, you know, tell, me, tell us about T cells, tell us about antibodies. Tell, you know, people got very engaged in that discussion. I think what we have to do is carry that level of, and it, to be clear, it's self-interest, but it's self-interest motivated by all the right things. And that is people want to live longer, healthier, happier lives. And if we can help them do that and give them solutions, then they'll turn on the ability to participate in this stuff at an earlier stage.